Studio Collective Podcast. Uh, my name is Dosh. I'm a musician and educator based here in San Francisco. And today I have here with me a special guest, James Fish. Hey there, I'm James. Uh, I'm also a musician, designer, synth geek, uh, movement artist, a bunch of other things. Uh, I'm visiting over from Berlin where I'm based, uh, back to SF where I used to live. And I'm really happy to be here uh, in the studio. And James, one of the really cool things you did on your trip here was play a live set at Public Works um, a couple weeks ago. So uh, you want to tell us a little bit about that? Oh yeah, uh, that was a blast. I mean, it was uh, such a pleasure to be back in town uh, for the first time in over almost two years. You used uh, to live here, yeah? Yeah, I used to live here from 2013 to 17. Okay. I uh, moved to Berlin in 2017 thinking, hey, it's going to be like one year. I'll get more deeply into music production and I'll be back in a year. Um, and then it's four years later. Uh, and of course, mid, mid that four years, the pandemic hit. And so I really couldn't come back, um, back home. And so coming back wasn't just about, you know, playing this gig. It was really, you know, 80% of this trip was just to be, you know, in community again, to, um, hang out with friends, uh, to see my family, some of whom are based out here. And then the, the, you know, the icing on top was, um, you know, getting this booking at, at Public Works, which was like a club where, uh, I consider kind of a, a musical home. I mean, you, it's the club that I've been to most. Yeah, time, exactly, so. exactly. It is like you know, the, if I could pick one club in SF, that that is the club. Uh, it's also the place where I got my um, sort of DJ debut, so to speak. Oh, really? Um, yeah, actually, I was going through some stuff at my parents' house, and I found the old flyer for when I was opening for Atish and uh, Hodge in the loft oh, wow. uh, one night. Back and in like 2013, 2014, or this was maybe 2015, March okay. 2015, something like that. Nice. Um, and just getting to compare that with like playing a live set in on the main floor, uh, not in the loft, uh, and opening for Acid Poly and you know special guest Nicola Cruz. I mean, that was a. It was really cool to see you know the different feelings of like oh how far I feel I've come since since then. One of the things we've talked about a lot is your trajectory from being a DJ playing parties like in love to being able to play a live set which is your original music and uh, obviously you're doing a lot more up there now than you were when you were DJing and mm. so um, tell us a little bit, bit about that both like your personal transition like why did you start jumping into live and then um, about a little bit about how your live set works like uh -huh. so many different live artists have different ways of playing live what does that really mean um, I'm sure a lot of a lot of our uh, viewers don't don't really know uh, much about what live means and it's a mm, conversation mm. you and I've had a lot over the last few years and so um, yeah dig, dig in uh, I, I love I love this question I mean we could fill up easily like two three hours about this um, and I know you understand a lot about it too given that you're also a live artist um, but yeah it's like it's like why why live uh, part of it is sometimes feels a little bit like like masochism right like just giving yourself more and more to do on stage um, but I think the, mo the motivation was uh, several things. One is like, as a DJ, I, I really enjoyed DJing. Uh, did it for a number of years in the in the burner scene here, a little bit in Berlin as well. Um, but I always felt like, you know, my, you know, calling is a bit of a strong word, but like the, the, the most resonance I felt was as a, you know, as someone who wanted to eventually create their own music and, uh, and play it back. Um, and then have that element, extra element of control, like that I'm you know, really can improvise on the fly. You know, I grew up doing music as a lot of us sometimes have, you know, you know, uh, piano lessons and violin lessons as a kid. Um, I come from a musical background in that sense that, uh, you know, my my mom and my sisters are both uh, pro and semi-professional dancers. Oh, wow. uh, I also have a dance background personally. And so I feel like there's this feeling of wanting to be deeply in touch with, with uh, creating something um, that's my own and like expressing it. Uh, on stage that was a big driver of that. Um, and when did you make yeah. that shift? You, you've been DJing for a while and was there a moment where you're like, okay, now I need to take that next step and mm -hmm. either learn, start learning production or, or like how was your journey from becoming, being a DJ to actually making your own music? Yeah, uh, I mean, I really started DJing back in college, like doing okay. uh, college parties, et cetera. College? I was at Harvard and, and Cambridge. Okay. Um, and so I was kind of really involved in the, in the, uh, the, um, what, what are they called? Um, cultural organization scene there, okay. um, you know, Asian American Association. I was running a, a small group called the Half Asian People Association, was the BSA, Black Students Association, etc. I was sort of deeply involved involved in that kind of uh, cultural org scene and okay. the, kind of the parties we'd throw. And so I kind of like, you know, cut my teeth DJing literally with a mouse, you know, controlling elements of this virtual DJ software. Um, but the most fun I got out of it was like, what can I combine that hasn't been combined before? I really into mashups, like. That was like my 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 guilty pleasure like backstory into production was like can I make my own mashups and what like, are some songs you mashed up? Uh, oh man, I did Fat Joe versus the XX, <laughs> 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 which 
we thuggin over intro, of course. Uh, there was a mashup competition where Ratatat and Sarah Bareilles, I always can't okay. say her name right. So I mashed up, you know, 17 love songs, uh, Nas versus Ratatat. Uh, Anyone dare play that stuff in Berlin today? No. You know, I you know I'm looking for the for the right time and moment to drop that in because I feel like it still hits, like it still it still slaps. Yeah. <laughs> for me personally, this is like guilty pleasure. Lady, I'm like, I'll listen to that again. Yeah, that was a good idea. Um, so that was like the early early. I was literally like putting stuff into Audacity, time stretching it manually to find you know the right you know beat. It's, I didn't. I never even heard of Ableton at the time. I don't Got even it. know if it was out then. So you were starting to try to play around with samples and create music even way from when back you started DJing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. So um, it's always been a part of your journey. Hundred percent, hundred percent. And then uh, I had a brief stint in Berlin, uh, in Istanbul, and then Berlin when I was uh, just fresh out of college, like 2011, okay. 12. Um, and so that was like my first brush with like the you know the deep house melodic melodic house techno scene, uh, you know coming out of Berlin, uh, of course you know coming out of Detroit and Chicago by way of Berlin. Yeah, let's honor the full history of that, <laughs> please. Um, but yeah, uh, I got into DJing you know more house, uh, deep melodic tech house, whatever you want to call it, uh, in Istanbul actually. We threw our okay. own parties there. And then friends were showing me how they were using Ableton. I downloaded it and started, you know, making edits. I think I made an edit of an Iron and Wine song, like a got deep it. house edit of that, which, um, you know, we got a couple thousand plays on SoundCloud. Nice. You know, it's a nice put something out there. Yeah, a little, little, little start ego boost. Yeah. Um, and then uh, came to the Bay, had an opportunity to move here, and uh, didn't want to pass that up because I'd always wanted to live in the Bay Area. Okay. And why? Why here? I don't know. I think I visited here on a college, you know, visit trip with, you know, checking out, you know, Stanford and all that yep. with my mom a long time ago. Hi, mom. Thanks. <laughs> and fell in love with the city and was like, I need to live there at some point. And so, although I love Berlin and could have seen myself at that time living there longer, um, I was even like interning for a label I really liked at the, at the time. Um, and I, I was just like, you know, I can't miss this opportunity to SF. And I'm really glad I did because here I felt like it was the right time and size uh, and I was in the right you know, stage of my you know adult young adulthood where everything fit really well in terms of finding kind of a, a musical community and okay. and at least getting more into DJing I didn't get too much into production during my time here um, and then yeah that back to your original question of like when did I get more seriously into producing and to live sets uh, that was at the tail end of, uh, of SF the decision to move back to Berlin and and uh, scale back my, you know, uh, my design tech job into more of like a, a freelancey thing to make more more room in my life for for learning production. And four years on, I feel like I've gotten better. Finally, it took a lot longer than I expected, though. Yeah, yeah. you you mentioned that San Francisco had a pretty rich musical community for you, um, and I've found it's actually been hard for me to kind of develop a bit of a bit of that community. Um, I'm curious as to like how you ended up making those connections and like. What was that community like for you? And like, mm -hmm. if, if you're someone in San Francisco, if you're a musician, like, how do you go about finding that? That's a that's also a good question. Uh, I always tell this story because it, it's still like, it's still kind of the like uh, right place, right time, luck, and like very nice people. Uh, you know, were all the factors that that made that um, really happen for me here, and why I still feel like I have a, a strong connection to SF, uh, both musically and in, in non musical community. Um, so we're gonna start with the story. I was moving here from Berlin, and a friend of mine had been showing me these mixes from this guy named Atish on on SoundCloud, and I was really into these mixes. I was actually like shazamming a lot of these tracks and going through his track lists and downloading those tracks and playing them myself and <laughs> just cribbing a lot of of musical notes from this guy. Um, and and my friend told me, "Hey, when you get to when you get to SF, you should write to this person and mm -hmm. and see if." Uh, and see if he, he wants to meet up. And I'm like, yeah, no way. This guy's got like 10,000 followers. So no chance. Um, but, you know, I took her advice and I did it. And I reached out. I sent a SoundCloud message. And to my, my delight and surprise, he responded within like a week. And I said, yeah, hey, uh, you know, my name is James. I'm moving from Berlin. I see we like some of the same labels. Uh, you know, I used to intern for this one that you play a lot of tracks from, blah, blah, blah. I was just like trying to slide into his DMs, so to speak. And he responded. We met up for tea. Turned out to be a super nice guy. And he invited me. He's like, "Hey, you know, I think you'd really like uh, my this event, Two Two Tuesday. Mm -hmm. uh, I play it every every month. It's kind of a burner scene, scene party. You know what burners are? Blah blah blah." I went. I showed up alone, really early. It was the first person on the dance floor. And that night, I met the crew that would later become like my you know, my community, my dance floor community, and then my Burning Man camp as well, all, all in it. one, as well as many other friends. Um, to make a long story short, uh, I ended up becoming his roommate some years later. 
Uh, he's still a very close friend, uh, personal friend, and a bit of a music mentor to me as well. Um, and then when he left for New York, uh, where he lives now, I ended up becoming lucky enough to be asked by the, uh, the event producer, Carla, who'd been running this event for like, you know, eight years at this point to take over as resident DJ. And so this came like full circle within three years at like the yep. first event where I ever like set foot on a dance floor and like met all my, all of my friends became like my DJ residency. Like it was just always home, you know? Yeah. And um, I, I imagine that's how a lot of these collectives form, right? Which is the people being able to promote people who are, who are, grow out of the community um, is a really great way to kind of continue yeah. to foster that and support local artists who are on that upswing, right? Yeah, totally. Now obviously is quite, quite big having grown out of that scene and uh, yeah, being able to create space. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's really great that you, you had that opportunity. Yeah, and and uh, you know to get back to your question of like what you know how to approach that when going to a new city, um, you know it, it's interesting to hear you say that you found it difficult to find musical community here. I guess I could I might be able to see that from the perspective of like finding the right uh, collaborators and so on. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's I didn't really try that when I was here. Okay. I was more speaking from the perspective of like finding a, a community of people I could DJ to and with. Yeah. Um, you know what I mean? Like that I find is like. You know, the, the sort of American uh, SF style Californian just show up, put yourself out there, say hi, be nice, wait for your chance, but put yourself out there. That, that seems to work here in a yep. way, or it worked for me very well. Uh, I don't know how well that works in Berlin. I haven't really tried it as hard there as yep. I did when I was here. Um, but then there's the other part, which is the like, you know, creating musical community of, of uh, collaborators and, yep. and the thing that you're doing with Studio Collective, which I think is really awesome. and. Uh, totally, totally necessary. I felt I've, I've spoken to people, friends of mine who are talented producers uh, and have been here for a long time, longer than I've lived here, who say that they feel they lack that. Yeah. And you have to, you have to, you have to ask yourself, like, you know, maybe that person didn't want it or need it or look for it. That's fine. But um, you know, is it also there? Is someone putting in the legwork? I think that you are to like create that, and that's why I think it's really cool. This project. Yeah. Nice. Yeah, um, yeah I kind of had a similar experience where like getting that first step into DJing, there was just so much support and welcoming, whether that's events or people willing to kind of give you a chance and put you put you on a stage, mm -hmm. um, even if you hadn't been there before. Uh, and then I think, w kind of as you pointed out, the place where it's been harder is then moving into the production side and finding other producers who are doing it at a, at a pretty serious level. Mm -hmm. um, and mm -hmm. also recognizing that a lot of folks who are growing out of the San Francisco scene Folks like Atish or um, or others are moving to different cities once they get to a certain threshold of, mm, of success, and mm -hmm. um, uh, maybe maybe you're one of the, one of those as well. Having moved to Berlin, um, <laughs> guilty, but, guilty. Uh, <laughs> it was only supposed to be a year, but actually that that reminds me though. I have to say, mad respect for for those of you who don't know, uh, Ashu came over to Atosh came over to uh, to Berlin this summer to check it out for what two months, two right? Two months, yeah, two months. And for th for those who've never been to Berlin, if you come over during the summer when, you know, assuming things are open with COVID and everything, uh, it's hard to say no to that city, to the to the thought of like, should I move there or not? And I have, I have mad respect that you saw what was going on, you had a great time, and then you were like, no, I'm good. <laughs> and you moved back, and you stayed here. I, I have mad respect for you. Um, and I, I think that's it's, it's really difficult when you see, or like it's, it's um, it takes a lot of, I guess, uh, I don't know if integrity is the right word, or like just um, you know, clarity of vision to, to be able to, see what you have here and the potential here, see what exists over there in a city like Berlin, which for a lot of people is like that musical mecca. And that's kind of yep. what drew me there as well to like get serious about producing, right? Yep. Um, and then, you know, come back at some point. Um, and then be like, actually, I'd rather build that based on what I have here. Yeah, that's that's pretty cool. So props. Nice. <laughs> um, before we dive into Berlin, because that's a big topic. Yeah, yeah. I think the two of us can uh, talk for a while about. But uh, before we dive in there, I'd love to kind of hear about uh, when you are performing your live set, mm -hmm. uh, what does that entail? What gear are you using? Let's like really geek out on that. Hell yes. um, and <laughs> I think obviously you don't use a computer or Ableton in yeah. your live set, which is uh, in stark contrast to most uh, live, uh, live acts out there. And so, mm. um, yeah, ge geek out with us. Tell us a little bit about um, how it actually works. Sure. Um, yeah, so I, the first few live sets I ever did actually were involving Ableton and a push. Okay. Um, I just ha I got burned too many times. My, my laptop's ancient. I never invested in upgrading it. It would crash on stage. Uh, it's so funny how many live acts have like tens of thousands of dollars worth of gear they tour with, and they won't spend two k on a laptop. Right. Yeah. Is, like, so this is exactly your live set. This is exactly <laughs> me. Right. Right. Um, so there, there were, uh, okay, that's one component. One component was the crashes. The other component was that um, uh, I had built a live set uh, that was primarily uh, based around clip launching and scenes in okay. Ableton. So um, it it felt a little bit like DJing with 
Excel. Like, okay. scenes, scenes. Like, you could just, you could literally stand there. And I, I, I found myself being on stage, like, what am I actually doing here? Yeah. Um, if I'm not really able to well, you manipulate. Being on Excel on stage? <laughs> That's well, not the dream, is like being on Excel in front of 500 people? <laughs> <laughs> to be fair, I do actually really enjoy Excel, but in a different context. Um, not as a performance art. <laughs> not as a performance art. And, uh, you know, actually, is, you know, as an aside, I have seen somebody built a drum sequencer in Excel. Ah. You can actually do that with macros and like very... Anyway, we're getting, we're getting away from the, the topic here. Um, but we are definitely geeking out. Um, so yeah, I had to have these experiences with, with Ableton live sets where uh, it felt a little bit like, hey, what am I actually doing on stage if I'm, I can't really manipulate anything other than this pre-recorded stem, right? Okay. Uh, or, or a group of stems. I'm muting things, I'm un unmuting things, I'm sending things to effects, but like, can't, I didn't really feel like I could touch it as an instrument and the push didn't feel, I hadn't set up my workflow in Ableton in a way where it was an instrument. So this is not a knock against Ableton at all because I have a lot of respect for people who do do Ableton live sets. Yeah. Um, I think I might return to it someday as well, okay. having you know experienced both extremes of and it. Maybe move back to San Francisco too. Yeah. <laughs> hey now, <laughs> slowly slipping that in there. <laughs> one, one thing at a time. One thing at a time. Um, so yeah, I had these experiences, and I was like, you know what? I want to just try getting away from it and see. You know, I'd heard about the Octatrack as okay. a kind of a, a masochistic pinnacle of like of live act hardware geekery of like, oh yeah, they use an Octatrack. They must be really good at what they're doing. There is a little bit of, of anti... What, what, what is an Octatrack? Uh, an Octatrack, <laughs> subject of an hour-long thing. <laughs> an Octatrack is a device about, about yay big that functions... Uh, it's like a Swiss army knife okay. uh, uh, for live performance. It's described as a performance sampler, which it really is. It can mix in audio from external inputs, so you can have synths and drum machines running like into it. a mixer, it. a sampler... A mixer, a sampler, and sequencer, and sequencer all in one. And okay. you can play you know, pre-recorded stuff or make new stuff on the fly, right? So that's kind of the, the heart of the setup. Uh, I then ha kept on adding around it. Uh, actually, my first my first live set was using the Digitact, which is like the you know little brother sibling of the Octatrack. Mm -hmm. It's basically an Octatrack, but reduced down to be, uh, being a a sampler that can function really well as a drum machine. Okay. Um, and sometimes as a sequencer. So I had that first. I did a actually my first you know uh, dance live set was actually here two years ago before COVID uh, at a private friends uh, you know for friends only party uh, in the Mission. Um, shout out to Glenn Dzinski, thank you, Mission Dance. Um, and so that was like the basis of that. And then I expanded from there, got the Octatrack, got the Digitone, which is like a, a FM a digital synth um, that pairs really nicely with those. And then kept on adding from there. I have a Minotaur for bass, for this Moog bass. It's really rich, lush. Have a Eventide H9, which does the effects. I can do kind of a send and return from the Octatrack uh, out and back. And then... Um, I have the Ocho Boom, which you also have back there, mm -hmm. which is a very nice end of chain, kind of extra bit of oomph sauce, glue, compression, saturation, warmth, or so they say. A um, couple of extras, I have a Pioneer AS1, which is a really nice mono synth for noodling, doing kind of synth lines, keyboardy stuff, and then a bunch of MIDI controllers that control the various aspects of what's going on with these quite complex, uh, quite deep layered electron uh, you know, it's the Octatrack, Digitac, and Digitone are all made by the same company. Um, and so the the approach there was like, once I had one of these units, um, I took kind of a cue from from Stimming, one of my mm -hmm. favorite artists, not only because of his music, but also because he's of his geekery and philosophy around live performance. Um, he also has had experiences playing in Ableton or with the OP1 from Teenage Engineering, and then he moved to the Octatrack. Um, and he said something that really stuck with me, which is... Uh, with Ableton and these things that you can really set up any way you want with a MIDI controller, um, eventually one trap you, one can fall into, I'm paraphrasing here, is that you can always be in setting up stuff and you don't build up the muscle memory to really mm -hmm. perform it like an instrument. When you pick an instrument and you and you say, I'm going to ascribe, uh, subscribe to this, this workflow that this company or product team has built, um, it's not going to be perfect the way your mind is mapped. But if you get to learn it and stick with it, you'll build a muscle memory. It's like learning an instrument. It's like learning an instrument, right? And so that was kind of the thing. It's like I already had the Digitact. The Octatrack was just the next step. And I have these three electron things on gear on stage. Any one of them is like kind of a, a steep learning curve. But once you know one, the others kind of fall it's into place. To map, yeah. And I build a muscle memory. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I found myself falling in that same trap because I love gear. I love collecting gear. I love learning gear. Uh, I love figuring out how how and what it can do, and I, I can easily fall into that trap of of perfecting the perfect setup and never you know hardly making any music. 
Yeah. Yeah. Cool. And uh, like, what's your headspace like on stage? How much of this music have you pre-written versus uh, it's being mm. improvised live? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. What it, like? What's going through your head when you're performing? Yeah. Uh, I'd say for this show in particular, about eighty percent of the material was written. Uh, in the one to two months leading up to the show, okay. like specifically for the show. I do you do this for every show where you're writing new material for a show, or do you maybe write new material for a series of a few shows? Yeah, I mean, I'm not playing uh, more than a handful of times in a year in this okay. live context. So uh, I'm always writing new music and kind of pick cherry picking from, you know, it's sort of like a DJ would do, right? Yeah. Um, so it's a combination of like, you know, have I written something recently that I'm still inspired by? Uh, does it fit the upcoming show? If not, can I adapt it to fit, it to fit the upcoming show? For example, mm -hmm. I've been playing at like 126 uh, be okay. beats per minute, um, this live set uh, earlier in the year at, at, a, at a small regional burn called Keatsburn in Germany. It's fantastic, highly recommend. Um, and like 126 is like my tempo. It's like groovy, but yeah. it's still, you know, enough space between the beats. It's really like, you know, New York, SF house, uh, deep house, minimal groovy stuff. Um, but for opening for Acid Poly, Pauli, who plays uh, more hypnotic, uh, a lot of slow slow motion, down tempo, you could say, uh, psychedelic down tempo. He's hard to categorize, but I, I think of him as psychedelic down tempo. Um, you know, 120 seemed like a better fit, so okay. I figured out which tracks from my earlier live set could fit being pitched down like that. And then I, for many of them, I actually rewrote um, or reprogrammed the drums or the synth lines to be less aggressive, to have more space. Um, retune the synth patches and then for a lot of the other material um, I was just collecting bits and pieces of things I'd written in the last few years and being like that'll work for the show let me structure something around that there was that um, uh, indie indie tronic uh, mm -hmm. you know uh, I don't know what, what, how to categorize Alice Harding I guess you could call it indie folk music um, really beautiful vo uh, female-led vocal at the end, which I'd remixed like two, three years ago when I first moved to Berlin and felt like, hey, this could work now. Mm -hmm. Let me write a new bass line and a new path line. Um, or the uh, Nord drum, which you have one of those as well. Um, I was up in Petaluma at my parents' place. I screwed around with it for like three hours, recorded a bunch of long takes, and then was like, that has the element of weird and quirky yeah. and trippy enough. Let me build something around that. So I'd say like, of what you heard that night, there were two or three tracks that I, that I would consider like baked in a sense, but they don't really, and they're like stemmed out and like they're like demos that are ready to go okay. on on my in Ableton. And the rest was just like all based around the stuff I'd written in the hardware, like sketches, but like sketches that have been really worked on a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. So they've been polished, mixed down and have kind of a cohesive vibe, but maybe the actual arrangement is not there or... Right, the arrangement isn't there. I, I'm arranging it, you know, by hand, essentially, the buildups, the breakdowns, etc. cetera. Um, and that's a bit the challenge, is that that's kind of a reason why I might move back to Ableton as well, is because if I do want to, uh, you know, if I am, you know, blessed with a, with a more peak time gig or something yeah. like that, where there is more of an expectation for these, you know, nailing the build and the drop, Yeah. Um, I only, I only have two hands. I mean, you know this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, the Octatrack's great for that. There, you know, I can load in a long sample and like have that be the core element that builds and drops. And like I could smash together that with a bunch of effects and risers and drops and fills. And then the the live element can be just a digitact or like me noodling on a synth. And, yep. you know, question is like, what is live? But yep. that's a whole topic, right? Yeah, it's, I, I think definitely also understand that distinction between something that's a peak time or an o opening. And it was also quite different because the expectation on something that is peak time is like, it has to be on fire all the time. The audience has to be constantly engaged and entertained. It's like mm -hmm. going to watch a Pixar movie where it's like something should always be <laughs> attracting your attention. Right. Uh, at the extreme example, it's like, mega EDM with like big drops or, or big big builds and big drops or like the Lego movie is like the movie example where it's like there's constantly something happening yeah. everything's changing really really fast yeah um, and obviously that becomes a lot harder and so I see a lot of live acts who are doing a little bit more of like this thing is pre-arranged they're maybe not even using session view in Ableton mm -hmm. but they're actually using the arrangement view mm -hmm. and they're maybe adding some drum fills or adding a few things here and there as sort of color and sprinkling on top of it but ensuring that they have certain moments that are really 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 baked yeah. um but I think that, that yeah it comes back to the question of like what what is live like how much needs to be improvised um i personally really like kind of the, the approach that you're taking which is doing the arrangement live is something that allows the like the sound quality to still be really really strong the mix down to still really be mm. really strong and 
those ideas can be communicated on on large systems. Um, but still, there's something about the arrangement that lets you respond to how the crowd is feeling in that moment. Like if mm -hmm. they really like the track, mm -hmm. stay in it, right. do more with it. Um, right. So improvise um, or sample yeah. something and, and loop it and yeah, yeah, pitch it around. Yeah, yeah, yeah. cool, definitely. All right, thanks for sharing. Sure. Um, well, let's talk about Berlin. Let's do it. Uh, how has it influenced your music? Um, what was the thing that made you kind of want to want to go there? And yeah, what, what's your tell us about the city? Yeah, uh, I mean, I'll start with what made me want to go there. Uh, as I mentioned, I'd been living in Istanbul for a year, kind of in a gap year after after college, um, and uh, a lot of the friends that I I made during that time that I was DJing with were Erasmus, it's like exchange students from, from Berlin or from Germany, but were based in Berlin. And so a lot of them were encouraging me like, hey, I like your sound. I think mm -hmm. you'd really like Berlin. You should come check it out. Come visit with us. We're going to Fusion. So at that point, I'm 22. Fusion was my first ever music festival. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so kind of like, I don't know where you go from there. I guess that after that, you know, came Burning Man or whatever. But but uh, yeah, I visited from 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 uh, from Istanbul to basically go through Berlin directly to, to Fusion. Um, and then, of course, we stopped in Berlin, you know, for a night as well. Um, and then my uh, someone I was dating at the time decided to move to Berlin that fall, and I decided I'd follow her. Um, and that, thus began this kind of like year long, um, you know, experience of living in Berlin. Then I was 22. I was, I was uh, in a school program there that my friend had recommended to me in design thinking uh, down at the D school in Potsdam. Um, and just had a fantastic year. Like we were, uh, you know, I was learning design. I was, you know, working, you know, uh, a little bit as a designer for a company in Turkey remotely. Uh, but really just like, you know, when you're 22, you can go out, you know, two, three nights in a, in, a, in a row on a weekend and just like see all of what, you know, or most of what that bubble in Berlin has yeah. to offer. I won't claim to know all of Berlin because it's actually much broader and deeper than, um, you know, just the, just the nightlife scene. Um, but uh, that's how that, that kind of started and that exposure to these kind of sounds and like, you know, going out to Kater, Katerblau, uh, no, Katerholzig at the time. Yeah. Um, uh, or, have you seen or the Bar 25 documentary, by the way? I still have not, actually. Uh, <laughs> I need to, it, it, had, it, had, it had closed like one or two years before my first year there as a student. And, okay. and so it was still this time when like friends I'd make uh, there, made there, were still talking about, oh man, I can't believe it's closed. You know, like yeah. it was so good. Um, Kind of in the same way that you know, I don't know, a lot of you know, club clubs in Berlin are also undergoing uh, um, a lot of a lot of pressure from the changing yeah. dynamics and uh, capitalism in the city, gentrification, etc. Um, so you know, Johnny Knuppel is another one that closed uh, recently. I never also never got to experience. Um, it's yeah, it happens. It's happening. And it's a bit a bit sad. But anyway. Um, Back to the point was like you know where uh, what got me into into it was like why did why did I why was I interested in Berlin I think as a city and maybe you can relate to this there's this feeling especially during during summer of this like it's both socially progressive in in many ways mm -hmm. um, in mo some ways more than others there's this feeling of um, I guess of freedom you could say mm -hmm. to to a night out. Um, you know, it's, it has a lot to do with the, the, the zoning and the codes of like that a club can stay open yep. uh, for an entire weekend and that uh, the city is accessible. And yes, it is cheaper than many other cities from a pure, you know, uh, cost of, you know, living uh, mm -hmm. uh, point of view. <laughs> There's this feeling of of city life as as a adult or a young adult. And I think a lot of people this is not this is not a radical take. This is not a yeah. hot take that it uh, it feels very liberating to be in a city that's both socially progressive uh, very accessible, relatively inclusive, and has a high tolerance for just this kind of, um, you know, honestly just fit. fun, dynamism, arts, yeah. culture, and high tolerance for sound, sound, and um, and experience without without the sheen of, uh, you know, VIP bottle service, uh, all that, all that, right? And you know, having lived there and then come to SF and experience, you know, SF is not super bottle servicey in the in the deep house or deep deep, you know, electronic scene, for sure. But it's still a very, you know, obviously very expensive city by contrast. Yeah. And the fact that I don't have to uh, spend money to enjoy myself in in Berlin, um, in in many ways, uh, is is really wonderful mm -hmm. uh, and really feels very liberating. Uh, felt very, very liberating as a as a young younger adult at the time. Um, 
you know, obviously in SF, you can get around spending money by like going to nature and stuff. But mm -hmm. like, if you get to go out, like it's, it's a different equation or if you go to a festival, it's a different equation. Um, and then how does it affect my music? Um, yeah, I would say, I guess what I've been telling people uh, is that, or what I've been feeling is that in some ways it seems like each city is ahead of the game or ahead of each other in different ways. Like okay. in SF, uh, it's clearly like, a, you know, for better and for worse, uh, ahead of, of the game, like tech and, um, uh, yeah, tech wise, technology wise and capitalism wise, which has, you know, blessings and curses yep. uh, and very many of both. And so, like what's hot here in, in, in that realm might might creep over to Berlin after mm -hmm. some years, like crypto, for example, right? Yeah. Like people just started talking about that this year um, there. I'm like, yeah, what? Like you you haven't <laughs> thought everybody had a little bit, like, <laughs> but um, but yeah, I mean, that's that's also a beautiful thing that, you know, being in Europe, people are just like, yo, slow down. Like, well, if, if the benefits of that thing that you've just created, which is apparently great, uh, after a few years, are are really all that great? We'll take it, and if not, we're gonna GDP. Well, we're still taking crypto, even though we don't yet know. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> that, that, that maybe an exception, but, but yeah, GDPR, for example, is a yeah, great exactly. is a great. Well, that wait yeah. and see. I like that about being over there. It's like uh, I like the the anti capitalist nature of a city like Berlin um, a lot. Um, it resonates with me strongly. Yeah. Um, and then you know other things like um, uh, the conversation around diversity, inclusion, uh, microaggressions, and what it means to be a person of color. Mm -hmm. uh, I feel like I'm in Deja, I mean, I'm in Groundhog Day having to relive that over there. It's like creeping over there. Interesting. The demographics, yes, are different, but the conversation, I feel like, uh, yeah, actually, no, sorry, that's that's the same direction. I feel like it, it does, it is a very uh, American conversation, first and foremost, and then kind of creeps over there. And now we're starting to have, you're starting to see blacker and femmer lineups uh, in Berlin, which I'm like all for, but like, yeah, why wasn't this conversation happening five years ago? And that's really interesting because you, you describe Berlin as this very socially progressive city, and I think that's, uh, at least a lot of Americans, we look at Europe and like, hey, they're doing a lot of things yeah, right uh, yeah. in these ways. And so wh why do you feel that that conversation around diversity has been delayed in Europe? I think a lot of what I hear from friends, when, when, I, when I complain about this, which I do often, and I talk to friends about this, the response I get is like, yeah, but the demographics are different, and so you're, uh, you're not... and, and uh, uh, Germany wasn't as colonial, so the, the demographics are different and we don't have that conversation. Which is wrong because Germany did have colonies. Yeah. Um, and I'm not a scholar on this. I do actually know scholars on, on these things, so I'm not going to, uh, you know, speak t too much at length about this lest I, like, butcher some factual thing um, or, or misspeak. But um, I feel like that's, that's part of it. I also feel like, yeah, Berlin and Europe in general feel very progressive on a number of issues, such as, um, I don't know, like, I feel like uh, club culture and, and queer culture seem like they're very talked about and mainstays Consent of the culture, scene. Consent culture, sure. uh, tolerance around nudity, body positivity, mm -hmm. um, gender fluidity, sex, um, uh, you know, things that we would call socialist here, like, you know, paying people a living wage Free and, education. And, and healthcare. Free healthcare. These, all of these things are awesome. Like, I'm all for yeah. them. They're doing a great job. You know, I'm very, you know, happy to not, you know, be worried that I might, you know, break break something and go broke. Um, uh, or that I won't be looked at sideways uh, somewhere for, you know, expressing gender flu my gender fluidity or, uh, or whatnot. But, uh, but yeah, maybe it's the maybe it's that um, um, you know the U.S. has you know not singularly but certainly very strongly this history of um, of of of, of uh, you know racial dynamics uh, and that's baked into our history and that dance music here uh, has its roots in, in black and brown communities mm -hmm. where that's I think was more of a topic for a longer time and now is being reintroduced as a topic maybe or introduced as a topic. Um, you know, over in, in, in Berlin. And I have friends who are uh, literally like stepping up and doing this work. Uh, my friend Camille, with whom I, uh, Ashu, uh, was, you were there actually. Yes. Uh, uh, Camille was the vocalist. Uh, we did a collaboration uh, and, 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 and you helped shoot that, uh, that live set recorded on my rooftop in Berlin, which should come out hopefully sometime in the next few months. Oh, awesome. um, still in the editing phase. Uh, but yeah, Camille, they're uh, organizing something called Emergent Based Berlin. I have to give I a shout out to, to one of their events. It was great. 
You did, did you? Uh, Floyd Levine played. No, was one oh, that was the one I Berlin. didn't go there. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. So I finally made it to one after, I think after you had left, uh, left Berlin. Uh, just a fantastic event for like kind of rem reminding people that the roots of this kind of rhythmic dance music culture are based in black, brown, and queer communities. Yep. Um, and so I think that that conversation is happening more and more now, and that's really refreshing to to see and hear, um, as a you know, especially as a as a artist and musician of color. You know. Yeah. Um, you asked how uh, how the the city has shaped my sound. Yeah. Uh, and you were oh kind yeah. Of talking about how like so much of the Berlin sound does make it to San Francisco, but a few years later, kind of yes. like how some of these conversations have made it to Berlin a little bit. Uh, exactly. A little bit later. Um, yeah. How's how's it? How's that affected your sound? Yeah, totally. Um, yeah, I couldn't have said it better myself. I think I think the the Berlin sound does kind of migrate back here and kind mm -hmm. of cross pollinate. What feels on right now uh, there is I feel like there's this like bifurcation in the scene. Okay. What, like half the scene is going harder and faster, sort of like an ironic callback to semi ironic but actually earnest callback to the '90s. The love for it days. Yeah, like happier, harder core, not happier, definitely harder, hard, more like hard style elements and I mean, trance. BPM has such a like, yeah, curve, like, we're talking 140, 150 yeah. breakbeats rave. Like it's called yeah. like melodic rave or like or rave techno. I don't even know what the genre yeah. is called. And but. we've been in downtown Berlin for a while with Burning Man, Robot Heart, Cutter Blau has exactly. become so popular and it's like, what was cool can't remain cool. And so <laughs> yeah. we're back on the upswing. I mean, right, one of right. my friends who's actually helped me build out the studio quite a lot, uh, Matthias was spent his twenties uh, as a music producer back uh, back in Germany um, mm -hmm. in like the Love Parade days, and um, he used to make music at one sixty, one seventy. Oh with my god, no problem. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And today, like, I don't think I've been to a single like mainstream club in San Francisco or like even like popular club in San Francisco that's ever had a night that's 160 or 170. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, just like, I, I would guess if anyone's going to do it, it's going to be like F8 or Underground SF. Yeah. Uh, or like more of these like sort of boutique techno. I mean, there is a techno scene in SF. Still in the 140 tops. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and they're doing cool stuff, but it's it's definitely a, not as like mainstream in SF as yeah. it is in Berlin. So there's that one part of the scene is going faster. And like, I love that because you know, I grew up on trance. Like that was my like foray into electronic music oh, as a really? fourteen year old. Like listening okay. to old Sasha and old, old Tiesto, <laughs> um, and all this Balearic, Chicane, um, Paul Van Dyke. Uh, you know, all BT, all this great, mm -hmm. you know, kind of flowy stuff. Um, that was faster in those days. And uh, then the other part of the scene, I feel like, is still slow, but has taken some cues from from techno. So it's it's no longer this like shamanic deep ethereal like uh yeah we call it keta pop is a nod to like the <laughs> substance of choice that a lot of people partake in that really fits this kind of scene of like slowed down music mm -hmm. and beats but also has a lot of these world music influences but what's happened i think people have gotten a little bit tired of that and they've started borrowing elements like harder harder percussion and more trancey arpeggios and like Really nice sound design, but it really punches and cuts through a mix. Yeah. And often and so also it's... more intricate percussion, yes. which ironically is also does have a lot of roots in, in African uh, music and exactly. Indian music. Exactly. Um, so it's like we're now borrowing the percussive elements from those cultures rather than just yeah, a yeah, sitar sound. Hyena, Floyd Levine, a bunch mm -hmm. of uh, you know, um, and 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 the nice thing about that is that it might be one fifteen or one twenty, but it's going to feel faster because mm -hmm. it's so punchy yeah. and there's like a lot of hi hats and shakers in the mix that like. Are really rhythmic and groovy, um, so I guess it's like melodic, melodic techno or or melodic down tempo. I don't know what what to call it yeah. genre wise. But yeah, it, it there'll works. be a name in five years. It but, works. But yeah. now it's just emerging. Yeah, so I feel like that those things have both colored my sound. Like I'm very tempo fluid, uh, but I I love playing around with break beats. Okay. Um, always have. Uh, broken beats are a big part of my sound, and then um, also just the 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 punchiness, the sound design, the. Uh, I feel like I've got become a much better sound designer just by like being out in a club and then coming back home in Berlin, being like, okay, you know, maybe the next day, like hungover or whatever. How can I recreate what I just heard with yeah. this FM synthesis or or with this wavetable synthesizer, or this analog synthesizer or whatever? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's definitely one thing that I noticed about going out in Berlin as well is like so much of the music has just such thought and care given to the sound design. And, uh, arguably, maybe even just a German characteristic of you think about the best cars that have been machined and. Mm. precisely mm. crafted in a certain way. There's so much of that attention to detail in engineering and fundamentally sound design and a lot of music production is also kind of like an engineering. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, mm -hmm. and, I, and I think they, they, a lot of the producers do their, do that really, really well. And there's a lot of 
uh, emphasis in the scene to make sure that people who are going to be playing music to hundreds of people through these large sound systems that actually have a physical impact on you yes. because sound is a very physical mm -hmm. phenomenon um you're going to be really thoughtful about like shaping and making sure that it's not going to like hurt you or or a hundred percent hundred percent and like that's bringing you back to here and like why getting a chance to like practice here the week leading up to the show here was such like a yeah it was it was such a gift like being able to practice on in in this studio with these monitors um in this context where i could really turn it up and like dial in on you know on these like very nice monitors my mix before going up and playing on the function ones at at, at public works was like it, it made the night it, it did two things one of one of which is i i think and i i hope it made the music sound better <laughs> and secondly uh, you know it also gave me more confidence when i was on stage that like if when i introduce this element it's not going to blow someone, someone's eardrums or just sound really harsh in the mix like i was able to really dial those those frequencies and those those elements um to just sound way better uh, before hitting the stage so cool. yeah thanks again for that yeah of course um, so one of the really cool things you've been doing in Berlin recently is uh, throwing these little creative retreats. Mm. Um, yeah, tell us about that. Yes. Uh, so my my partner and I had done some like uh, self work retreats um, or work work from home retreats uh, early I think early during COVID, uh, and this was like two or two years ago. Yeah, just after the start of pandemic, um, or it may have even been the year before that. Anyway. Um, she had wanted to work on some papers. Uh, I had wanted to work on finishing tracks, as, mm -hmm. as you might know. Like, starting tracks is easy, finishing them is like work, right? Yeah. Um, and when do you know when you're done? And so I had had some advice from friends, like, literally just set goals and like try to finish a track a day. Um, so I went there, and in 10 days, I actually made five tracks, which was pretty cool. Wow. Um, and like, yeah, these felt finished, right? And then, uh, you know, fast forward a year and COVID hit, and I thought, I'd like to do this again, like given what I've learned since then, but I'm missing the sort of, you know, creative exchange with other musicians. Mm -hmm. um, I do have many musically talented friends in Berlin, some of whom are, are, are serious about production or their own craft. And so I started putting out feelers um, just to see who would be interested in it. And it took a while, but once I got, you know, six or seven people committed to this idea of like renting a house together mm -hmm. for two weeks, um, we did just that. We went up to this place in about an hour and a half north of Berlin at a, at a garden, um, like a community garden that has a house you can rent. And the owners loved the idea. We could sort of be as loud as we wanted. Um, we all brought our own studios. And it was, just, you know, obviously in one house that's not treated, it was kind of a cacophony during the daytime. Uh, but it was fine. We all communicated. And then there was a, next to it a barn where uh, we could host for each other workshops, okay. um, for example, on music theory or sampling. I did one on sampling, yeah. one on synthesis. We, and then uh, a very good friend of mine named Antoine uh, is very talented at jamming and teaching the basics of jamming to those who've never really done it before. Okay. So we had a couple jams too and then showcased our work to each other. Um, so that was the prototype. And I'd like to, I, I am going to continue doing that next year, uh, nice. hopefully with a slightly bigger group and maybe even some more space. Okay. Um, I would also like to get a few more producers and electronic producers in, in the space. Um, it was very, I, I liked that we had a very mixed group. Um, so I could learn from a, someone who could play saxophone as well as a Nord keyboard uh, yeah. and then teach them, you know, the Digitact. Uh, so I think having a good mix is, a, is an important part of that characteristic of these retreats so far mm -hmm. um, to not just stay in the, the techno zone. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, would you recommend for folks who are trying to get more serious about production that they move to Berlin or not? <laughs> um, that's a good question. You know, I think I think so much of learning production. And I'm not I'm not a master of production either, so I, I can only speak from my own experience. Mm -hmm. But YouTube's just been awesome. Yeah, <laughs> YouTube has just been so awesome during the pandemic that like yep. it, online course. I mean, <laughs> paying paying for for knowledge at this point in 2021. Uh, you're paying for the guarantee that someone has definitely curated this and maybe there's some reviews, but there's so much that is, if you know where to look and if you ask around is out there for, for free. Yeah. Um, that I don't necessarily recommend having to move cities to learn production. Uh, for me, it made sense at the time. I mean, everything hindsight's always 2020 Yeah. At, at the time, because I, I wanted to have enough time to delve into this. And I felt like the combination of, 
being exposed to this, you know, beautiful sound systems and context mm -hmm. and music that I love uh, at the source. I mean, I'm using source very liberally here. Um, but yeah, Berlin is a, is a source of a lot of great music. Yeah. Um, that was a factor. Uh, being able to go over there and freelance was a factor and mm -hmm. like, you know, cut down to a half-time job was a factor. Um, and, you know, being around, you know, a different subset of friends that are serious about music was a factor. So I, I don't recommend that for everyone. I think if, to more broadly speak about what make could make it work for for you, dear, dear viewer, uh, would be like, yeah, find friends who are as serious about it as you are. Uh, meet up with them regularly. Uh, ask a lot of questions. Don't be afraid to ask questions of others. And uh, like exchange knowledge. Like this, the knowledge exchange thing. That's like the best part. Like I teach you this thing, you teach me that thing. We jam. Uh, I've learned more from. I've learned just as much from watching like friends sit down and do stuff in Ableton than, mm -hmm. I, than I have as I have from from you know YouTube tutorials. Um, yeah. And uh, make time for it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> cool. You can do that anywhere, right? So yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. cool. All right. Well, thanks so much for uh, for having this conversation. Hey, thank you. This is yeah. really cool. Really cool conversation. It's uh, it's great to be back. And again, thank you so much for all you're doing with for musical community in SF. Yeah, thanks. It's super important. Um, and James just released his uh, recording from the live set uh, opening up for Asset Quality at Public Works. So definitely check that out on his SoundCloud. Um, and we'll also be releasing a set video from his rooftop in Berlin. So stay tuned for that as well. That's right. Thank right. you. Take care.